I met him in 1947 or 48. He was one of the nicest gentlemen I think I've ever known in my life. He was warm, he was friendly, he was shy. Uh, he was a typical scientist. He's a man who had really perfected the cathode ray tube that made modern television possible. Up until the time he did that, a television worked on a mechanical scanning system uh, where the, the uh, a wheel was used to scan the pictures. But he perfected the cathode ray tube and that was a breakthrough that allowed for the manufacture of television sets. He licensed it to RCA and it was behind all of their uh, manufacture. So he was, in that respect, he was a genius in, in having done that. And he had alongside of him a very capable uh, engineer scientist type in Thomas Goldsmith, who was uh, with him all through uh, the development of the cathode ray tube, the setting up the manufacturing facilities and uh, the broadcast facilities. The manufacturing in about 1949 or 50, manufacturing not only produced television sets, they had a television set division, they had a uh, transmitter division, created transmitters to stations all over the country. Uh, they had a government division that uh, primarily manufactured radar and other uh, instruments for the government and a broadcast division. And there was a head for each one of these divisions, mine being the broadcast division. And uh, the year I think it was 1950, uh, we did, the whole company did over a hundred million dollars in income from these divisions. And Dumont, as I said, was the chairman of the board and the president both had occupied both uh, offices and ran the whole thing. And what was his philosophy on, on running the company? Basically, Dumont only wanted to make television uh, cathode ray tubes. As a matter of fact, the truth be known, he invented radar by reason of the, the cathode ray tubes making radar possible. And he took it, and this was in the late 30s, and he took it to the the uh, Navy Department in Washington, and they pleaded with him not to apply for patents because it would make the, the radar system available to anybody who wanted it. And the Navy wanted to keep it uh, top secret because it was too valuable an instrument for uh, weaponry, for uh, navigation and all the other uh, activities of radar. And Dumont agreed not to apply for a patent. It so happens that within three years, two other guys applied for the patent and got it. And he was just, you know, he was a total gentleman. And he listened to the Navy and he said, okay, fellas, I won't do it. And he didn't do it. And uh, it cost him a great deal, but he, he never looked back and he never got angry about it or anything. And I never saw him angry. Uh, he was always talked in very mo well modulated tones and never got excited and uh, was, was very, just a nice man to be with. Is that how he ran his meetings as well? Yes, unfortunately. Because ultimately, that's what sank him. He didn't have the authority that a 
man running a, a big complex like that should be able to exert. Everybody liked him, but that wasn't enough. How did your relationship change with him um, as you moved up the ranks in Dumont? When Whitting quit, he, Whitting informed me that he was leaving and going to Westinghouse. And I got a phone call from Dr. Dumont, who said, I want you to come over and have lunch with me. He operated out of Montclair, New Jersey, or Clifton, New Jersey, was his, his uh, factory. Montclair was his home. And he was a member of the Montclair Country Club. And every day he'd have lunch at the Montclair Country Club. And he said, oh, meet me at the club and we'll have lunch. I went over and I met him. We went in for lunch. In the middle of lunch, he said, you know, I suppose you've heard Whitting is leaving. I said, yes. He said, I want you, oh, Whitting has recommended that I make McGannon the head of the broadcast division. He said, but I don't know McGannon. He's only been with us a couple of years. I know you, and I want you to run the broadcast division, the network and the stations. I said, well, Doc, you better think about that a little bit. He said, what do you mean? I said, my religion has something to do with this. He said, your religion? What's that got to do with it? I said, Doc, I'm Jewish. He said, so what? I said, if you look at the other networks, you'll find that the top network man is not Jewish in any case. You got Jack Van Volkenberg, Bob Kintner, Pat Weaver, and so on. He said, well, what about Paley and Sarnoff? They're Jewish. And I said, well, the advertising agencies don't hire Jewish executives, the big agencies, and because their clients don't want to deal for the most part, with Jewish executives. I said, you take an agency like J. Walter Thompson, or, or I want to name several others, they, you won't find a Jewish executive in any of those agencies. So the head of the network has to deal with those people, and that's the reason. And he looked at me and he said, Ted, he said, if anybody doesn't want to give us their business because you're Jewish, I don't want their business. And that was the end of it. I, I, that was the kind of a man I was dealing with.